Hello, colleague. I decided that I was going to take just kind of a random case and record the modifications that I make for Invisalign because there are so many things you can do to make a case more predictable. So on the left or on the right, this is the case. Let's take the attachments off and the IPR off just to visualize it a little better. We have an edge to edge bite with crowding of the lower. You might see something like this in a class three type case, but we actually have a solid class one posteriorly. If you look over here, that means when you have edge to edge anterior, anterior, but solid class one in the posteriors, you probably have a bolt in discrepancy. You can confirm that go to bolt in mandibular excess, which is the same as maxillary deficiency. I didn't measure these teeth fully, but you can see how narrow this lateral is. This one's a little narrow also. And the lower teeth here are deceptively triangular, so they sort of add up to more width. So the clincher came back with IPR on the bottom, uh, and we're going to evaluate the need for that in a second. Um, and then uh, in terms of, let's take that off for a second. If you look at the occlusion of the patient starting, the, there was no chief complaint of occlusal issues. It was really just getting the lower teeth straight, making the upper smile look nicer. Now watch, when you looking at a clinch check, don't only go step by step, go start to finish, start, finish. So there is a little bit of movement in all the molars and really for no reason whatsoever. You might think, well, why not get it better? But the problem is when you start moving molars around, Sometimes the movement isn't constructive. It may not play out. A lot of times you'll get a posterior open bite just because you tried to move molars. And instead, the force that was desired to say rotate a tooth ended up intruding it or intruding it. So I made these. You can right click and make it not move. And if you look over here, this is the modifications I made. That is the shadow where there's no movement at all. So I'm leaving that as my foundation. This is a key tip that I use in a lot of cases. So that's one little trick I did. Now, second of all, uh, in terms of the attachments, I'm not a big attachment guy. Attachments are required for certain movements. I'll give you an example of one tooth though. This one, though it's small, though patients will accept an attachment if they need to. This tooth is leaning in and we wanna move that tooth out as you see here, see this? But if you look at it in this view, notice how the tooth is having a mesial root angulation. And we can always deal with that later on. But what I did is I took the attachment off. I still am realizing or plan to realize the alignment movements, but I left the tooth angled. Now I left some space around it because we have that Bolton discrepancy. And in this case, they actually finish the case with a very tight occlusion. And look at how the anteriors are actually moving in for some reason. Now, there's maybe because the default was trying to tighten up the space there, although it's not even a space. You do not want to move teeth in unless you have to. That's when you get anterior prematurities. And most faces don't benefit from moving teeth inward unless they're flared to start. These are not flared to start. So here... What I did was I aligned the upper arch, but I actually intentionally opened space around here because I know that this tooth is going to need a crown or bonding, or I've informed the patient that that's what I think. And this way, I finished the case with a little bit of a perhaps transient overjet, so I clear any potential interferences. Now, other teeth that I took attachments off, I don't need them on the molars for sure. The retention will be no problem. And... I took the attachment off that tooth because I'm not really rotating the root at this point, especially if they're going to get a veneer or bonding. There's not, really, there's not really a need for it. And if you look at the lower anteriors, for example, you want to limit in all your clinchecks extrusion, plain and simple. Now, maybe we're going to extrude this tooth to level it as a, as a function of the root angulation, but look at how there's extrusion of all the teeth, uh, of the lower anteriors. Why do we need to make the bite go into a slight, almost deep bite like this? Whereas in my plan here, we still can have a nice result. I can always bring these in if I want to end up closing that space more. But I am now only extruding 
this tooth and maybe the other central just a little bit, but I don't think I need attachments for that. So I'm going to just reduce it to one. If you're extruding teeth, these optimized attachments, there's basically no rationale why a smaller attachment would be more effective than a larger. So I just choose the stock beveled attachment and I make them big. <clears throat> these I really am not a fan of. <clears throat> I also took attachments off some of the premolars because I felt like the movement of those teeth was not complicated. And the canines also, they are long teeth. So for example, I think I can get a little root angulation just using the leverage of the crown itself. Uh, what else do I have to show you? Um, Oh, also in the anteriors, <clears throat> look at how the one central is a little teeny bit longer than the other. <clears throat> and they address it by moving down. And that related to that deep bite. But I'd rather push teeth up. So I take the longer one and move it up a little. Uh, and then I don't need attachments on it. So we have a similar type case. The overall theme of this case, Bolton discrepancy, to me, it's all about that lateral incisor. So I'm creating space around it. This plan, the default that Invisalign created, um, closed that. Now, you might be able to recognize this if you're less experienced and say, hey, wait a minute, I have to bond that tooth. But imagine if you just have a lateral that's a little small that you didn't actually measure or see. That's why, you know, sometimes they don't account for that. So um, and then in terms of the IPR, on the bottom, um, yeah, I'm going to do the I, I'm going to do that IPR because I have super accessible contacts. Notice how the contact point, maybe here, I'll wait till I get a little bit more alignment. But my contact point is up high, and that's going to be these teeth are very amenable to IPR. But if you this particular patient, if we want to have a safe, nice result, I'm going to explain to them, hey, to get your smile looking better, there's you may have to pick two pick up from two poisons, opening space on top and restorations or filing on the bottom. If he did not want any filing of the bottom, then this lower arc would therefore be more forward. And if he didn't want any space on the top, the upper arch would be in more. And then you'd have something that kind of results like what you see right over here or, or even tighter. And that would be problematic. All right. So I just thought I would share some things that I do in a lot of cases to make things more predictable without sacrificing the result or the chief complaint correction, if you can.